I name this ship Ark Royal. May God protect her and all who sail in her. In 1950, the then Queen launched the biggest ship in the Royal Navy's history. Ark Royal would become a symbol of British naval and military pretensions around the world. As war winners, we felt entitled to keep an empire we could no longer afford, together with armed forces around 750,000 strong. We kept fighting in Kenya, Korea, Cyprus, Malaya. But Suez changed everything. The 1956 attempt to retake the canal became Britain's last big military adventure before the Falklands War. An Anglo-French task force landed in Egypt and was pushing inland when the United States wielded its economic might to force a humiliating withdrawal. Suez became the foremost symbol of Britain's decline and retreat from empire. Totally and forever, Britain was on the way out. The United States rubbed in unwelcome truths about our shrunken status, most notoriously when former Secretary of State Dean Acheson made a 1962 speech to West Point cadets. Great Britain has lost an empire and has not yet found a role. Acheson's words prompted a memorable sketch in the BBC satire show, That Was the Week That Was. Acheson's wild words have caused an international furore. Nonsense! That was the week played out a fantasy exchange between Prime Minister Harold Macmillan and President Jack Kennedy, which seemed to many British people too true to be funny. Uh, about, about this interesting thing, Jack. Uh, it's Harold here. Uh, Harold Macmillan. M A C R. <laughs> I'm calling from London. Now, now look here. This thing doesn't represent the views of your government, does it? Oh. In 1968, HMS Eagle, Ark Royal's sister ship, quit Hong Kong. A nation that wants to call itself a great power must be capable of independent action. The Labour government's withdrawal of our forces from east of Suez proclaimed to the world that this was no longer possible for impoverished Britain. We are withdrawing more quickly from the Far East and the Middle East and making big consequential savings in defence expenditure. We are recognising that we are no longer a superpower. As part of a series of 1960s defence cuts, plans to replace the strike carriers Eagle and Ark Royal were branded unaffordable and cancelled. Within a decade, both ships would be decommissioned, leaving Britain without a big carrier to project power and support so-called out-of-area operations. The BBC's James Cameron saw the end of the East of Suez era. There goes the last of the gunboats. She'll almost certainly never come back. We'll never come back. Not in the way we used to think of ourselves. But nobody seems to have decided what sort of a future Britain wants. Yet in 1975, a politician thrust herself to the front of the national stage who did know what she wanted Britain to be. Margaret Thatcher was elected leader of the Conservative Party. We're not living up to the best in our character. In speeches delivered at the low point of Britain's post-war fortunes, she offered a vision of a nation that might once again achieve self-respect. The same spirit that made us a great nation is still there, but somehow we're not using it. There was an awful sense of the inevitability of decline, an economy that was uh, stuck in the past, in us, on the margins, uh, slowly slipping away, and everyone talking about the British problem. I do not intend to be the first woman prime minister of a mediocre and declining Britain. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. When the Conservatives won the 1979 election, 
Mrs. Thatcher got her chance to reverse the nation's course. There is now work to be done. But her first years saw strikes, soaring inflation, civil disorder and harsh economic medicine. I will not change just to court popularity. Even Thatcher, the proponent of British greatness, determined to save money by imposing yet further reductions on the armed forces. The Royal Navy was to shrink by 20%. Its newest and most expensive ship, Invincible, faced the axe. Her crew, which included Prince Andrew, were told that their vessel, Pride of the Fleet, was to be sold to Australia. Naturally, we, we think we serve in the best ship in the Royal Navy. We're all very happy with her, and we're most disappointed that she is going to leave us. The sale of Invincible was all the more painful because the ship heralded a new age in naval aviation. Much smaller than the old Ark Royal, she could nonetheless provide a platform for the revolutionary Sea Harrier fighter. The cuts devastated the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Henry Leach. He was a wonderful man, Henry Leach. Um, he was a sailor, sailor. He and John Knott, the Defence Secretary, simply could not get on at all. John Knott was determined to castrate the Royal Navy. For Leach, the sale of Invincible was the ultimate betrayal. Just months before the outbreak of the Falklands War, the first Sea Lord was on a collision course with his Defence Secretary. Modern sailors fight more of their battles ashore than they do afloat. One icy winter's day in November 1981, the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Henry Leach, found himself reduced to taking the slow, slow train to remotest Cornwall to interrupt Defence Secretary John Knott in the midst of a shooting party to try to stop him selling the carrier Invincible to the Australians. As a young officer in World War II, Leach had been involved in the last big gun surface action by a British battleship, the sinking of the Chandos. His father had been killed when the battleship he commanded was sunk by Japanese aircraft off Malaya. He'd been with his father the night before he was killed in the, in the Prince of Wales, when the Prince of Wales repulse was sunk. And Henry knew the, va the value of aviation, the value of air cover. The main reason, of course, they were, they were lost was because there was no air cover. He was determined to make sure that uh, such things didn't happen again. The Admiral reached the Defence Secretary's refuge, Cahay's Castle in Cornwall, late in the afternoon after an exasperating series of train delays. After dinner in this superbly traditional setting, the doughty old sea dog and the politician sat down to have the bitter row which Mrs. Thatcher herself had flatly refused to meet the Admiral for. Leach, like every sailor, wanted the Royal Navy to maintain the means to project power far abroad. Not had simply been mandated by the Prime Minister to cut costs, scrap ships and concentrate defence in Europe. The Admiral could have saved his rail fare. The Defence Secretary refused to budge. The Thatcher government's brutal defence review caused morale in the sea service to plummet. To Young officers such as Chris Parry then was, racked their brains about what they might do to prove that the Navy still served a purpose. Everybody was bemoaning what that would mean for the Navy and also for our careers. And then somebody said, well, look, what we really need is a good war against somebody, um, just to prove to the public and the government how useful the Navy is. And so, amid a couple of pints, we started discussing who might be a suitable opponent. You know, not too difficult, uh, not too easy. And we eventually settled on a country which we thought was just about right. And the real surprise was it was Argentina. In April 1982, after decades in which budgets were slashed and the Royal Navy deemed increasingly irrelevant, fate threw the Admirals a wildly unexpected lifeline. 